Hi everyone. So here we are in Dr. Lori Eggert's lab at the University of Missouri. And we have on the other end, Two Mile Prairie Elementary School, their fifth grade class. And we are broadcasting live from the lab. So my name is Stephanie Shuttler and I am a PhD student. The Eggert Lab focuses on using DNA to study animals. And we use especially non-invasive samples, which mean that we don't have to get blood or tissue sample from the animals. We can use other sources. So the way I do it is I use poop. And as you guys know, I work with forest elephants. So I'm gonna tell you guys one of the techniques that I use today, I'm gonna to show you. And what we're going to do today is be able to tell an elephant, if an elephant is a male or a female, just based on it, the DNA that comes from its poop. And the reason why this is important is because you can get information about the population, so you can tell how many females are there and how many males there are, but I also need to know the females for my analysis. And I'm gonna talk to you about that why. So here we have a picture of savannah elephants. Savannah elephants live in these family groups. So you can see there's adult females here and their babies. So aunts, sisters, grandmothers, they all live together in these family groups. And over time, especially in the wet season when there's a lot of food and water, these elephants can form larger groups with their more extended family that are also close relatives. And they can even merge into these huge groups where there's hundreds of elephants. So what I'm doing with my project is I'm seeing if forest elephants have a similar extensive group structure as these savanna elephants. And remember, this is only the female. So if you were an, an, a male elephant, you would leave the group when you when you got to be about teenage years. So savanna elephants live in eastern Africa, which is around here, and also more southern Africa. Forest elephants live on the other side. So they live more in western Africa and also in central Africa, so more in the middle. The country that I work in is right here. I'm circling it right now. It's uh, called Gabon. And I work in the middle in a national park called Lope National Park. So here is a picture of forest elephants that I took. So the big problem with forest elephants is that they're really difficult to study. If you guys can see them, there's a mom and a younger elephant with her. And they're really difficult to study because they live in the forest. So there's a lot more vegetation, a lot more things that make them difficult to directly see. So poop is really helpful for scientists like myself because we can get information from the poop without ever even seeing the, the animal. And elephants are big animals. They eat a lot and they poop a lot. So therefore, we have, we have a ton of poop to work with. So here's what it looks like. Here's a picture of elephant poop from the field. And you can see it comes in these circles. And this is what's called a bolus. So what I do is I actually measure the circumference, which means around the bolus. And I do that for three uh, bolus, boli in one dung pile. And then I average them. And what that tells us if the elephant comes from an adult elephant or a juvenile elephant, which means it's a young elephant. So I'm gonna show you guys now how I do that in the field. Okay, so here we are in the lab and here is my elephant dung. So this, unfortunately, is fake dung. Uh, I made these bolus piles, but this is really what it looks like. So what I would first do is I would take a small piece, so I'd use a fork, or you can use a popsicle stick, and I would just scoop off a small piece, and I would put it in a tube. 
and I would label these different tubes. And they're not very big. You can see how big they are. They're, they're pretty small. So you only need a little bit. We try to get the outside of the dung because when the elephant poops, the cells from the inside of the animal are still on this dung. And remember, it has to be fresh dung. So we want it to be a day or less. So after I have my dung sample, I then measure it. So I take my measuring tape, and I'm doing the circumference, so I go all the way around it. Go all the way around. And this sample looks like it's 50 centimeters, and I would record that in my field notebook. I would do three of these and then take the average. If the average is 30 centimeters or greater, then that's an adult elephant. If it's less than 30 centimeters, then that's a young or a juvenile elephant. So this is what I, it looks like when I have all of my samples. So here's a bag of my samples. I have 500 of these. I went two times in Gabon for a total of eight months. So you can see that it's sort of liquidy. The elephant dung itself isn't liquidy. What happens is when I go back to the field station, I have to do a couple of things. First, I have to boil the sample so that it kills any sort of diseases uh, that might be in the elephant dung because these are being brought back to the United States. And I also add a buffer to it to preserve the DNA. So this can stay in Africa for four months and even years here in the United States, some of my samples are from 2008, and they still work. We can still get DNA from them. So I still have to get the DNA from the dog. So what I do is I go through a process with all these sorts of chemicals. I brought some here to show you guys. We have to do different things to it. We have to heat it, and we have to add all these different chemicals to it. And what that does is it breaks apart those cells inside where there's inside there's DNA. So we're breaking open the cells, we're trying to get the DNA and get rid of the stuff we don't want. So this is called a dung extraction. When we're finished, we have this tube. And I'll put it here so you guys can zoom in and see it. So what you can see is that there's only a tiny bit of liquid in it. So when I am doing my laboratory work, this is all I work with. I work in very, very small quantities of liquid. So I no longer have to smell the poopy samples. I just work with this little amount of DNA. But when I'm done with the DNA, dung samples compared to other things like blood or tissue samples are really, really low sources of DNA. So we have to make them bigger. So we do another process with a bunch of other chemicals, and we put those in a machine, and we copy them, just like a copy machine. So it copies the DNA into these huge, huge quantities. We can get millions of pieces of DNA. So the extraction process, it's an overnight process, and it takes a total of about four hours. So we can't do that today. And the PCR, the copy machine process, called a polymerase chain reaction. That also takes three hours. So we're not going to do that today either. But what we are going to do today is we are going to look at DNA from male and female elephants. So if you'll come over here with me, I will show you guys where we're going to be working. Wait, let me just grab some gloves. Okay. So, male and female elephants look different. Males are bigger, females are a little bit smaller. Males are just bulkier in general. The DNA also looks different too. So we're gonna take a picture of their DNA and we're going to show you what it looks like. So the first thing we have to do is we are going to make something called a gel. So here I have my beaker, and I'm going to add a buffer to it. I'm adding 98 milliliters of this buffer. Then I'm going to swirl it up a little bit, and we're going to add this powder to it. This is called agarose powder. 
You want to make sure that it's mixed up all well. Okay. Now what we do is we heat it in the microwave. Put it in here. We have a microwave just specifically for this. We put it for 30 seconds. So what this does is it obviously makes it hot. It's sort of like making jello. If you've ever made jello before, you have to get it hot first, and then when it cools, it turns from a liquid to a solid form. So that's exactly what we're doing here with this gel. And gel even sounds similar to jello. So we have to keep an eye on it to make sure it doesn't boil over, but we do want it to boil so it mixes. Okay, let's take a look at it. So I have my mitten here to protect me because the glass can be hot. I'm gonna shake it up a little bit more. It's still a little too cloudy. We want it to get clear. So we're gonna put it back in there for a little bit more. So you have to be careful that it doesn't get too hot in there so it boils over because then you'll have a big mess to clean up. And you gotta be careful when you're shaking it too because you don't wanna boil it yourself. The, it can bubble up and get real hot and then spill on you. So you don't want that to happen. You have to use a lot of caution. So you can see now it's starting to bubble up a little bit. There it goes. Okay, so we can take it out. Let's see where it's at. Okay, see how when it shakes, when you shake it, it gets really bubbly? So it's looking good, it's starting to clear up, but I think we should leave it in there just a little bit longer. So let's put it back in, hit start. Oops, hit start again. We reached the end of our 30 seconds. Okay, now it's looking good. Okay, so it's very, very hot, so you should be very careful. Even the beaker itself is hot. So see how it's much clearer now than it was before? So the agarose gel is made up of that powder, the agarose powder and buffer that we mix together. Next, what we have to do is we're going to add something called Gel Star, which is in this tube. It's a bright orange color. You guys all see that? So what this does is we are going to be taking a picture of this gel, but we're not going to be taking a regular picture like you do with a camera. We're going to be taking it with UV light. So UV light is the type of light that's in black lights. So if you guys ever been any place with a black light, you'll notice Especially if you're wearing white, it'll glow in the dark. So that's what we're going to take a picture with. This gel star will allow the DNA to glow with that light. So we're going to mix it up there and you can see it becomes a little orange. What I use to get the gel star is this pipette. So this is just a way to measure out very, very small uh, pieces or amounts of liquid, amounts of volume. So this is very, very precise and you can get very, very small quantities. Okay. So once that is finished, we have our gel rig here. So we have in it a tray and the actual rig itself. So we're going to pour the gel that we've created into this gel rig. We're going to pour the liquid into it. Okay. A little bit more. And then we're going to put these combs in here. This is what the combs look like. And you can see they have um, like little indentations in them. So this is going to create holes in the gel. So we'll put this in this slot. So see how it goes into the gel? 
You put this one in this one. Okay. So when the gel hardens, so remember I said it's like jello. So now we have this a liquid. When it cools and it hardens, we'll have something that we can work with. So I have one over here that's already hardened. So let's move this out of the way and I'll show you the next step. Can we move this a little bit over here? Okay. So this is what it looks like. So I'll take it out for you guys to see. So that's that gel. I'll set it right there. So you guys can see now, this was the liquid part. You can see how hard it is now. It's just like jello. So now we're going to put this in here, in our gel rig, and we're going to take the comb out. And you can see that it's created all these little holes near the top. Can you guys see that? So this is where we're going to put the DNA in. So now we add a buffer to the gel. You can fill it up on both ends and you want to make sure all of those holes are covered with this buffer, which is just a chemical for the DNA to travel in. Here I have my DNA samples. So what we are going to do is we're going to cut off a little piece of plastic. Right there. And I'm going to make dots with dye. So this dye, you guys can see it's blue. You can see with your eyes. You don't need to see it with UV light. So we're going to make some dots. This is so we can tell when our gel is finished. And I'll explain what that means and what that looks like. So I'm going to put one row of dots here. Oops. So this is just a different type of pipette. You can do a lot all at once. So in this, in this DNA reaction, so this is the DNA that's been copied. You can see it's in these little tubes. So each tube is a different sample. So what we're going to do is look at each one of those samples. Um, I'm just going to do a couple today to show you guys how we do it. So let's take from this row. I don't think we did this row yet. <laughs> so we're going to mix the DNA with our dye. So I'm just going to increase the pipette. I'm increasing the amount of volume we're going to get because we need more DNA than we do dye. And I'm going to get a new tip. And I am sucking up the DNA into the pipette. Can you guys all see that? And I'm going to match the DNA with one of these dots. So if you get one of them, you'll hit them all. And there we go. So now each of the DNA samples is mixed with a dye dot. So then what we do is we put the DNA into the holes in the gel. So the first spot is for something called a ladder. And what the ladder is, it's sort of like a ruler. So when we're, when we're running DNA, we need to make sure that we're running the right DNA so we know what size it should be. So the ladder contains all these different sizes and we can look at our samples with the ladder to make sure it's the right measurement. So I'm going to put that in that first hole right there. And I put this colored sheet of paper behind the gel so you can see the holes easier. 
Now I'm going to take each dot from the plastic. Make this a little bit bigger. I'm gonna get a new tip. I got some bubbles. There we go. And I'm gonna put it into the next hole. So it looks difficult at first, but it's actually really easy to do once you get the practice of it. So I'm just putting the DNA dots in these holes that we created on our gel. Okay. So I'm not gonna finish the rest of them. I wanna show you guys what we do next. So, what, how, how the gel works, it's called gel electrophoresis, which sounds like electricity. So I'm gonna put this cover on here. And you can see there's cords coming out. So we're going to hook this up to a machine. And electricity is gonna come from here into this gel. So I'm gonna turn this on. And we want it to be about 96, that's right. And if you guys can see, it might be a little bit difficult to see, but there's a wire on this side and little tiny bubbles come up. And this pulls the DNA down. So how does this work? DNA has a negative charge. In electricity, the rule is opposites subtract. So this red wire here, we always say run to red because red is positive, so the DNA will be attracted to that. So over time, the DNA will start off in this well and slowly move all the way down the gel. So we have to wait about 45 minutes for this to happen. And like I said, males and females have different DNA, so this allows it to separate. So males have a couple of pieces of DNA and females only have one. So we can see that they separate across the gel according to their different sizes. So let's take a look at what that would look like. So I have another gel set up, but before we check that, I wanna show you what our results should look like. So I have here a slide for you guys of a gel that I have done before. So this is a picture under the UV light. So we took this with that special camera and I will show you guys that in a minute. So if we look at the gel, this, these are the holes that I made with that comb. So these are where I put the DNA initially. And then remember I said the DNA travels. So over time, where'd the mouse go? So over time, the DNA goes, sorry, I lost the mouse for a second. Over time, the DNA travels down and we get a piece of DNA here. So each one of these holes, I put a different sample in. So we have one, two, three, four, five different samples. Now you can see that some of them look different. So we have one here with one piece of DNA, and we have another here with three pieces of DNA. So we have one here, it's a little bit lighter, one here, and the third one down here. So this is a male. The male has these three pieces of DNA. The female only has one. And notice how it's always in the same position. So that's what we're gonna be looking for. So I think that other gel is just about ready, so let's go check it. Okay, putting my gloves back on. 
And if you guys can see this, it might be a little bit hard to see on camera, but the blue lines that were in these holes up here are actually now farther down. So this is just a different type of gel container, but it's the same thing. And the blue lines move down the gel. So now we're going to stop this gel and we're going to check it. So I'm going to turn it off up here. I'm going to take off the cover. And we're going to put it in this machine. So this is a special machine that takes pictures of gel with that UV light. So I'm going to open it up. This actually comes out. And we'll take the gel out. And we'll put it on here. And you can just push it off the tray, because now it's a solid. And just put it in the middle. And there it is in the box. So if we look on this computer, I have this program that's especially for gels. So we're going to start looking at the gel we have here. Okay. So you guys can see that there is an outline of the gel. The gel is all white. So we're going to close this door and lock it. And we're going to start to turn on the UV light and look at it underneath the picture. Oh, there we go. So here are our results. So you guys can see this is the edge of the gel. This, these are the different wells. This is where I put the samples in. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen samples just on this top row. It looks like we have two more down here, so sixteen. You guys can see that there's this one that has lots of bands on it. That's the ladder I was talking about. So if you have a big piece of DNA, it won't move through the gel that fast, so it'll, sit, it'll stay up near the top like that one. So if we had big pieces of DNA, they would be up here. Small pieces of DNA move through the gel quickly, so they are able to travel through it more fa fa faster and reach the bottom faster. So that's like these pieces. So remember that females only have one band and males have three bands. I'm sorry, pieces of DNA. So it looks like we have a female definitely right there and we want to ignore anything down here. That doesn't count. We only want to see where it is in the ladder. So it looks like we have a female there. It looks like that's a male. It looks like it has three bands. It's a little bit lighter. This, this one's hard to tell. I think it's a female. We have another female here, female. This one is definitely a male. You can see there's three bands. And this one down here is definitely a male. So this is what we do to take a picture of this. And we can turn off the camera. So this is what we actually do to be able to know if our elephant dung came from a male or female elephant. And when we're all finished, we can compile all of our samples, so add all of our samples up together, and we can get information about the population. So let me show you guys what that looks like. Okay, so here we have my results from Lope National Park. So on the bottom, we have the different age categories of elephants. So we have adult elephants, juvenile or young elephants. And some of the elephants, their bolus could not be measured because insects sometimes can eat it or get into it or elephants sometimes step on them. So these ones I don't know. But the big difference you can see is, so females are the red bars and males are the blue bars. You can see we have way more adult females than we do males. 
We have a total of 178 unique elephants and 89 of them are adult females. So I would like to hear your thoughts on why do you guys think that is and we can ask some other questions as well about what we did or the lab. So I, ho I hope you guys have enjoyed this. Okay, so now I have my earbud in so I can hear you. <laughs> okay, we're going to send some uh, people up to uh, ask you okay. questions. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, who's got a question? Um, Spencer. Spencer has a question. Okay. How do the elephants choose who lead the group? Okay. He asked, how do the elephants choose who lead the group? So in Savannah elephants, it's always the oldest female. And the reason behind that is because, have you ever heard the phrase, an elephant never forgets? Well, it's actually sort of true. The old females have a really good memory. Um, so the elephants remember more as they get older. And she's able to know more individuals in the population and also remember important things about where they live. So in Kenya, for example, this past year, there was a drought. So, so if you have an old female in your group, she could remember, oh, over here there's some really good water sources, so let's go over there. So it's the old members that lead the group. That's a good question. Okay, anyone else have a question? Why do you have to copy the DNA? So who is this? Serena. Is this Serena? Yeah. Okay. okay. So we have to copy the DNA because dung samples have very little amounts of DNA. So when the elephant poops, we need to get it within 24 hours because if things happen like rain and sun, this essentially kills the DNA. It degrades the DNA. So uh, we need to get it very soon, and even so, it's not coming from a live animal. Like it's not coming from their blood or anything. So, so we need we need more copies. It has very very low amounts of DNA. Okay, next question. Thank you. You're welcome. It's Catherine, and um, I want to know where is it easiest to find poop at? Ooh, that's a good question. Where is it easiest to find poop? <laughs> I so I worked in a park where there one were some savanna areas, and I would say probably the savanna areas. Once you find evidence that an elephant's been there. Because they're so big, they crush all the grass around them and they make these paths. So you can follow all these different trails. And usually you'll find poop. In the forest, the elephants use trails that they always use. They're permanent trails that they make. So when you go on these trails, it's harder to tell if an elephant has been there recently. It's much easier to tell that in the savanna. Good question. This is Journey, and uh, why, why do do you want it to be a day or less, day or less to, um, you can check, look at, look at the poop instead of like. That's a good question. So for elephants and where they live, it's better within a day because of those things like sun, and insects and rain. It can ruin the poop. Another person in my lab, she worked on otters, and they collected samples in January. So for otters, she found out that she was able to get poop samples that were several days old because a lot of times it would freeze, and that would help preserve the DNA as well. So it depends on the animal, but for elephants, a day or less. Otherwise, you don't really get any DNA from them. The chances go down a lot. Um, this is Michael, and I was wondering if um, there's ever been, if you've ever seen a group of males. I have never.
never seen a group of males. I know in the savanna elephants that they do hang out in groups, not as much as the females, so the groups are not as close, but they do have some groups. Forest elephants, though, I've never seen a, a group of male forest elephants. I've always seen them alone. Um, this is CJ, and uh, I was wondering, uh, why do you need them unique elephants, as, like, you're talking just a couple minutes ago? Why you said they were unique to... So why do I need unique individuals? Yeah. Okay. So, in one of the analyses that I do, I am looking at an actual network. So, which individuals are seen with, with which other individuals. So, if I see you and Serena together once at the school, I might assume that that's your only friend. But if I were to come back the next day and see you with Trevor, that would tell me something else. So I use all those different observations and all of the individuals to see how many friends that they have. Because remember, I'm working in the forest. So just because I see a group doesn't mean that there's not other individu individuals that are hidden from me. It's very hard to see them through the forest. Even the savannas, sometimes they can hide behind very large trees. So that's why I need to know who the individuals are. This is Marco. Why does... Why, Hi. Does, why does the... This is a Marco. Why does the gel have to be clear? The gel has to be clear because we just know it's well mixed then, and then the DNA can go through it smoothly. It's sort of like um, if you're going through a forest, it's easier to travel through a trail than it is to go through trees and brush. So the smoother and cleaner it is, the easier the DNA can travel through it. Otherwise, it might get stuck. This is Miss Ryan. And we are out of time. Hi. We are out okay. of time. But uh, we thank you so much. Guys, let's thank her. <laughs> you guys had really good questions. All right. Thank you for doing that. This is this was awesome. You're welcome. All right. Oh, good. I'm glad you liked it. All right. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.